Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to McLean Hospital Grand Rounds. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, two of our own uh, faculty today, uh, Drs. Uh, Brad Ruzika and Dr. Dost Unger. Um, today's uh, Grand Rounds is a crossroads in psychiatry. So this is one of the formats in which we pair um, somebody who's doing uh, research, in a clinical area, and we pair that person with a clinician, clinician researcher, to kind of comment on the relevance of the research and how it might inform clinical treatment or how it might change our field. And so again, today we're joined by Dr. Uh, Brad Ruzika. For those of you who don't know him, he's the director of the Laboratory for Epigenomics and Human Psychopathology and Associate Medical Director of the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center, and also an Associate Psychiatrist in the Center of Excellence in Psychotic Disorders at McLean Hospital, and an, an Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at HMS. He specializes in the clinical treatment and basic investigation of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. His research is focused on the role of epigenetics in the etiology and treatment of psychotic illnesses. Through analyses of post-mortem human brain tissue, his work investigates the molecular mechanisms through which environmental exposures, such as physical illness, psychological stressors, or chemical exposures influence genes and cells within specified circuits of the brain. His work aims to explain the etiology of these illnesses, as well as to develop improved treatments for patients. And for those of you who don't know Dr. Dost Unger, he is the chief of our Center of Excell Excellence in Psychotic Disorders, Director of the LEAP Center at McLean Hospital and the William P. and Henry B. Tess Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. In addition to his clinical work, he does research using brain imaging techniques to study chemical abnormalities in patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And both of them today are going to be discussing glutamate and GABA mechanisms in psychosis, both research and clinical implications. It's my pleasure to turn the conference over to Dr. Ruzika. Great, thanks Chris. Um, thank you to everyone in the audience. I'm excited to have the opportunity to tell you what's been the main effort in my lab here at McLean over the past two, three years at this point, and to jump right into it. Um, in the past 20 years, in the current era of uh, genome-wide association studies, our understanding of schizophrenia genetics has advanced considerably. Uh, from the early days of GWAS studies, where an experiment would um, often struggle to replicate a small number of findings, to the most recent effort by the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, a large assessment of more than 300,000 individuals, this most recent study found, um, has identified 270 regions of the human genome that are significantly associated with schizophrenia risk. And as our understanding of schizophrenia genetics becomes more robust, more complete, we're now faced with the very daunting challenge of translating that genetic knowledge into mechanistic understanding of schizophrenia. And this mechanistic understanding is what's gonna be required to maximize that genetic information to uh, create new, better treatments for patients. <clears throat> And again, this is a daunting challenge for many reasons, um, chief among which might be the heterogeneity of schizophrenia. So when I use the word heterogeneity here, I'm talking about heterogeneity within multiple distinct domains. When people talk about the heterogeneity of schizophrenia, they're most often, most likely talking about heterogeneity at the clinical level. Um, heterogeneity among the symptomatology experienced by a given uh, patient, uh, the phenomenology of their illness, heterogeneity and whether a person's illness is responsive to a, a particular treatment modality, heterogeneity at the level of biomarkers, things that you can measure in a living person, like a polygenic risk score, for example. Another area of heterogeneity and schizophrenia, and the area that's probably more relevant to the talk that I'm going to be giving, is mechanistic heterogeneity with the, within the complex cytoarchitecture of the human brain. So the human brain is, of course, a vastly complex system, um, arguably the most complicated um, object known to science. The brain contains hundreds of billions of neurons interacting through trillions of distinct connections. And within this vast complexity, schizophrenia pathology is not homogeneously distributed. So within the brain, which cell types are predominantly the ones that are impacted by schizophrenia pathology? Are those cell types the same or are they different from one region of the brain to another? 
how do those cellular pathologies build up to impact neural circuits and then um, cause uh, schizophrenia symptoms? How does the single shared genome, which is common among all the billions of neurons in the brain, how is that elaborated to cause these cell type specific pathologies? <clears throat> And so I'm going to talk towards some of these concepts within the um, in the context of the glutamate and GABAergic neurotransmitter systems of the brain. So glutamate is the principal, the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, and it is used by approximately 70% of cortical neurons. And in the cartoon here to the right, the green cell at the center of the plot is the um, is representing a, a pyramidal neuron, uh, uh, aka a glutamatergic neuron. And while glutamatergic neurons exist in multiple subtypes, the subtypes are fairly similar. They are mostly distinguished by the layer of the cortex in which they reside and um, their pattern of connectivity, the, the, the cells that they receive and the cells that they send information to. And glutamatergic neurons, they're pretty much the, the, the workhorse of the cortex. Uh, they do the bulk of the information processing. They pr uh, form the uh, long-range communication, the input and output to a given region of the brain. GABA, on the other hand, is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, used by the remaining 30% of cortical uh, neurons. And as opposed to the highly similar populations of pyramidal neurons, GABAergic neurons uh, exist in many highly diverse neural populations, distinguished by their pattern of connectivity, their biochemistry, their firing patterns, their morphology. And uh, GABA neurons are important in shaping and synchronizing the uh, coordinated uh, activity of assemblies of pyramidal neurons. So it's this synchronized activity of pyramidal neurons that is thought to be kind of the substrate of brain function, really what um, underlies information processing and, and consciousness. And in recent years, there's been a, a real onslaught, a real avalanche of evidence pointing to the importance of glutamate and glutamatergic synapses in schizophrenia pathology. So something that's been known for decades, something that's been observed quite a while back, <clears throat> is that in schizophrenia, there are reduced numbers of dendritic spines. Dendritic spines being the uh, structural component, the postsynaptic component of excitatory glutamatergic synapses. Um, this fits very nicely with something that's been uh, a very interesting um, finding from the genetic uh, studies, which is increased synaptic pruning um, through complement related pathways, through immune related pathways, overactivity of the removal of superfluous synapses during brain development. And in addition to this story, there's, again, just a, a, an overabundance, a real onslaught of, of uh, evidence from GWAS loci and protein coding mutations that really does converge on structural and functional components of these excitatory synapses in schizophrenia pathology. GABA, similarly, has um, a large literature supporting its importance in schizophrenia. And one of the most wide, uh, most robust, most widely replicated findings in postmortem analyses of schizophrenia is downregulation, decreased expression of glutamic acid decarboxylase, an enzyme that catalyzes the rate limit limiting step in GABA synthesis. And so this decreased GAD67 expression leads to Im uh, impaired GABA neurotransmission, decreased GABAergic tone. And this is speculated, this is thought to lead to loss of that synchronous activity of assemblies of glutamatergic um, pyramidal neurons. <clears throat> And this is something that has a correlate that can be observed in living schizophrenia patients um, who display decreased gamma band power on EEG um, uh, in relation to uh, certain tasks. And it's this decreased coherence of pyramidal neurons that's thought to lead to kind of fuzzy information processing. It's thought to lead to the cognitive dysfunction that is seen as central in schizophrenia. And so now to move on to kind of uh, some more technical aspects of the experiment that I'm going to present to you. Um, so on this slide, I'm going to talk about gene expression analyses, um, RNA sequencing studies. And for some years now, it's been common that an experiment would measure the um, expression of each and every gene in the human genome. Um, until pretty recently, though, the methodology, methods to do this required a fairly large amount of input. So the way these studies would typically be, be done is that you take a piece of brain tissue and you homogenize it. You put it in the blender and you uh, release the mRNA mo uh, molecules 
from all of the maybe millions of cells and hundreds of distinct cell types that are present in that piece of brain tissue. Um, and then you get a single measure of gene expression that's averaged across all those distinct cells. The problems with this are many, but uh, chief among them is that this approach makes your experiment sensitive to only the changes of largest magnitude. Any change that is more subtle, any change that's just happening in um, a subset of cells or less, uh, uh, less abundant cells is lost in the background, lost in the noise. Um, the other problem is that when you do observe uh, a significant change, something different between control and schizophrenia, you can't tell where in the system that change is happening, which cell types, which reach, uh, parts of the, of the circuitry. <clears throat> so in the past five years or so, um, there have been some exciting new developments, um, new genomics technologies that um, enable single cell genomics. And um, so here, instead of getting one measure average across all the cells in your sample, you get, again, um, a measure of each and every gene in the genome, its activity level, um, but you get that information within tens to hundreds of thousands of individual cells within your sample. And a fairly tired analogy that's made quite often is that while the bulk tissue studies, it's similar to trying to study, trying to understand something about the blueberries from your local market, but the only thing that you're able to sample from that market is their fruit smoothie, where the blueberries have been thrown into the blender with the bananas and the pineapples, and all you can look at is, is kind of the, the mixture, the smear. Um, in this analogy, then, the single cell genomics technologies, it's like trying to study those same blueberries, but now we're able to uh, sample the fruit salad. So in the analysis, we can pull the components apart and look at the blueberries in isolation from the kiwis and the bananas. So similarly, we can pull apart the different types of cells within the brain to look at each in isolation. So with all of that said, <clears throat> the study that I'm going to present to you today is a single nucleus RNA sequencing study in postmortem human prefrontal cortex, looking at uh, or making a comparison between control and schizophrenic subjects. And so this is a meta-analysis, the results that I'll present today, across two distinct cohorts. The first cohort was assessed here in my lab at McLean, and this is a deep profiling of 48 subjects, 24 control, 24 schizophrenia, capturing about 362,000 individual cells. The second cohort um, is or was assessed in the lab of Panos Roussos at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And this is a broad profiling of 92 subjects, 51 controlled, 41 schizophrenia, capturing about 107,000 individual cells. And not to get overly technical, I won't get too deeply into this, but just to introduce the methodology. So both of these cohorts were assessed independently using multiplexed single nucleus RNA sequencing. And the way that, that, that this works is we take a piece of brain tissue and from that tissue, we isolate, we extract intact nuclei. Those nuclei are then labeled with a sample specific an individual person specific DNA barcode and those bar, uh, labeled nuclei from multiple people are pulled together into a single sample, and that sample is then used to construct a single nucleus RNA sequencing library. After sequencing these libraries, we get a vast amount of data, <clears throat> which is basically just one gigantic matrix of um, gene expression for each gene in each cell. So the data that we're looking at is um, a large matrix, about 20,000 cells long and 470,000, uh, excuse me, 20,000 genes long, 470,000 cells wide. Briefly, the computational strategy we've employed is that this data is subjected to a batch correction to remove technical confounds. All of the data from both cohorts is merged together for a single joint cell type identification to identify what are the cellular populations that we observe in this data. This is done using ActionNet, a software written by Shaheen Mohammadi, who's my collaborator at MIT. After identifying the cells that are present in the, the samples, the data is split again and uh, split to perform a cohort specific uh, schizophrenia versus control differential gene expression analysis in each cell type using a tool called Muscat, which uses, uses a pseudobulk approach. And then we merge those cohort specific differential gene expression, uh, differential gene uh, <clears throat> sets using a meta analysis. And in these gene sets, I'm going to describe to you the characteristics of the genes, the biological processes that they participate in, um, upstream genetic uh, links to known schizophrenia risk loci, 
um, transcriptional regulators, um, trans, uh, transcription factors that are implicated in their dysregulation. And at the end of my section of the talk, I'll talk a bit about our attempts to move past cell states to look into, excuse me, move past cell types to look at changes in cell states in schizophrenia. So again, the initial step is the um, <clears throat> identification of the different cell types within the data. And this is performed using a clustering technique that uh, clusters cells based on similarity of their transcriptional signatures. And this approach in our data identifies 27 distinct populations of cells. Excitatory neurons are depicted in shades of green at the top left, in the plot at the top left, um, where deeper colors, darker colors, darker shades of green indicate association with a deeper cortical layer. Inhibitory neurons are in shades of red, where again, a darker shade of red indicates association with a deeper cortical layer. And then non-neuronal cells, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, are depicted down the left-hand side of the plot. And when we look across all subjects and examine the proportions of cells that we detect, um, <clears throat> the uh, fractionation of excitatory and inhibitory cells, uh, neurons, matches pretty much spot on those uh, that figure that I cited uh, from the literature earlier on. We see about 70% of the neurons to be excitatory, 30% of neurons to be inhibitory. And in this data, we capture about a third of the uh, overall cells to be glial or non-neuronal. And while it's been questioned, it's been suggested at points in the past that um, there may be changes, there may be selective loss of certain neuronal populations, certain GABAergic populations in schizophrenia. Um, our data does not, does not support this. And uh, so schizophrenia um, is often, is not considered to be a neurodegenerative disorder. And in our data, this is what's depicted in the uh, bars uh, in gray to the top right. We do not see any significant um, enrichment, uh, sorry, significant change in representation of any cell population between control and schizophrenia. And to look into the genes themselves that are dysregulated in schizophrenia, looking across all 25 cell types that are robustly identified in each data set, in each cohort, we observe 6,768 total differential expression, differential expression events. We see far more um, down regulation of gene expression than up regulation in schizophrenia. And the bulk of changes occur in neurons. So 93% of all of the changes that we observe occur in neurons. 77% of all of these changes occur in excitatory neurons. Across all of these uh, almost 7,000 differential expression events, we observed this uh, dysregulation of 2,500 unique genes. And one aspect of this data that I find especially interesting is that within those 2,500 genes, 120 genes are discordantly dysregulated. What I mean by that is that they are significantly upregulated and significantly downregulated in separate populations. This is something that, of course, would not be visible in um, prior bulk tissue studies. The um, red and green columns in the center of this plot, these, uh, this is a representation of the concordance, the agreement between the different analyses, um, the McLean and the Mount Sinai data sets, Mount Sinai and the meta-analysis, McLean and the meta-analysis, and then all three um, of the analyses. And as you can see on the, in the left-hand column, um, the agreement between the cohorts is strongest, is um, most pronounced in excitatory neurons. As you can see in the third column, the deeply profiled McLean cohort um, has far more power. It uh, does more to drive the meta-analysis than does the broad um, Mount Sinai analysis. But as you can see in the final column, we do observe significant agreement um, between uh, the, all three of these analyses in, um, uh, excuse me, uh, in cells across all three of these cell categories, excitatory, inhibitory, and non-neuronal cells. To look briefly at what these, uh, these expression changes look at the level of individual genes, um, shown here is the uh, expression profile of genes um, that are top ranked across multiple um, categories. So at the top left, the most significantly dysregulated genes, below that, the genes with the greatest upregulation um, magnitude, um, and then at, at the top right. I apologize this far into the talk that I don't believe I have a, a, a pointer to 
make it easier to follow, and I apologize for that. Um, but again, the most widely and discordantly dysregulated genes at the top right. To look into the significance of these the significance of these dysregulations, which biological processes look to be perturbed by these dysregulated genes, we performed a gene ontology analysis. To do this in an unbiased manner, we looked at enrichment of all known uh, annotated uh, gene ontology or GO terms, um, and then to make it more interpretable, we performed a semantic clustering of all of the terms that were significantly enriched. And so if you look to the heat map to the top right, you can see the um, dysregulation of these uh, meta uh, processes or themes. And as you can see, neurodevelopment and synaptic signaling are very widely perturbed, downregulated across a, a large number of neuronal populations. The remaining themes are dysregulated more selectively, those themes being ion transport, oxidative phosphorylation, synaptic organization, tau protein kinase activity, cognition and learning. These other three show more subtle, more selective changes in specific populations of neurons. To look in the opposite direction, to look upstream at which transcription factors look to be important in the dysregulation of these gene sets. First, we identified modules of transcription factors, transcription factors that look to be working together in our data based on um, looking at four groups of transcription factors that are expressed together. Um, this approach identified 16 coherently expressed transcription factor modules, one of which, um, module 10 in this presentation, looks to be far more linked to differentially expressed genes in schizophrenia than any of the others. This is um, linkage based on literature annotation. And indeed, um, transcription factor module 10 does show a highly interconnected central network of transcription factors, many of which um, in, are transcription factors that have uh, lots of other data from previous uh, studies, implicating them in schizophrenia pathology. Chief among these are TCF4, MEF2C, SATB2, and SOX5. Everything that I've talked about on this slide so far, again, comes from literature annotation. So to investigate whether we do see actual binding, actual interaction between these transcription factors and our differentially expressed genes in our tissue of interest in human prefrontal cortex, we performed cut and tag assays. This is an experiment that lets you map the binding of a specific gene of interest um, across the entire genome. This was performed in nuclei that were extracted from a subset of our McLean cohort um, that are uh, sort of uh, neuronal nuclei isolated by fax sorting. And as you can see in the heat map, we do see very strong preferential uh, binding of these transcription factors, MEP2C, SATB2, and TCF4, with genes that are dysregulated in um, this data set. And to this point, all the data that I presented has been looking at diagnosis as a binary variable, control versus schizophrenia. And able to, uh, in order to look uh, into transcriptional pathology at the level of individual subjects, we came up with something that we termed the transcriptional pathology score. So the way that this works is that in each uh, cell type within each individual, we look at, we score the transcriptional pathology um, observed in that cell type, depending on where it falls along the spectrum of change that we observe between the groups, control and schizophrenia. Each individual is then given an aggregate TPS, transcriptional pathology score, by aggregating those cell type specific scores across all the cell types within that individual. And so within the heat map shown here at the top, Columns represent individual subjects, rows represent cell types. And in this plot, individuals have been ordered, they've been ranked based on their transcriptional pathology score with um, more schizophrenia-like transcriptional signatures in shades of red to the right, more control-like uh, uh, transcriptional signatures in shades of blue to the left. And this transcriptional pathology score does show significant um, correlation with polygenic risk score. And as you can see, the schizophrenia individuals uh, shown, uh, sorry, colored in red in the second from the bottom row, show a strong tendency to aggregate towards the right-hand side of the plot. And that's something that we can give an, um, a significance level to using a GSEA, gene set enrichment analysis type approach. <clears throat> there are two things that I wanna call your attention to in this plot. 
So the first is that if you look um, from top to bottom within a single column, the degree of transcriptional pathology across cell types within each individual look to be fairly smooth, fairly similar. Um, this is something that's more apparent if you look at the extreme ends of the plot. And when we were coming up with this analysis, when we were thinking this through, I was not sure what this might would look like. I was wondering if we might see more of a mixing and matching where specific individuals showed preferential dysregulation within a subset of um, neuronal populations. But again, we, send, we see that within an individual, their cell uh, type specific transcriptional pathology looks to be fairly similar. The second thing I wanna call your attention to here is that if you look again at the phenotype row, um, you see that there are some individuals that are behaving aberrantly. Um, if you look to the left, we see a small number of uh, people with schizophrenia who are showing up towards the left hand of the plot, who are showing a uh, transcriptional signature that looks more like control than it does like schizophrenia. And this is something that I'm gonna come back to in a couple of slides. So additionally, as I said at the beginning, we looked into association of our differentially expressed genes and known schizophrenia risk, low, uh, genetic risk low side. And I wanna be careful here because association between a genomic locus and a gene is not straightforward, it's not trivial. So uh, with this data that I'm presenting here, I'm not making the claim that our data can explain the mechanism of the schizophrenia risk lowest high, but I do believe that it is valuable context to consider where, what cell types, and if it's up or down regulation, where a gene that is potentially regulated by a risk factor, where we see it dysregulated in, the, uh, in disease. <clears throat> And so to look at this, we focused on the 270 schizophrenia, uh, sorry, uh, genomic loci that are associated with schizophrenia. And we observed dysregulation of at least one gene in 129 of those 270 loci. Um, uh, most of that dysregulation occurs in excitatory neurons. Uh, a very small amount of these genes um, is, are most prominently dysregulated in glia or non-neuronal cells. But again, I do believe that this is valuable context and um, arguing towards the uh, increased power to add context such as this to these uh, types of studies, we find much greater concordance um, looking at the gene that we observe to be most significantly dysregulated within these um, regions and the gene that has been identified as the likely target of these um, genomic loci uh, assessed through fine mapping uh, efforts, again, by the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. We observe a, a greater power to, of uh, a greater degree of concordance with our single cell data than is achieved using prior bulk data results. And at this point, I'm gonna shift gears to talk about um, our efforts to invest, move beyond cell types and investigate cell states. So cell types versus cell states, this is an evolving concept in biology. And um, these are very enmeshed categories. Uh, a cell type refers to a cell's identity, something that is thought to be stable, not changing across the lifespan of a particular cell. Um, what kind of cell is it? Is it an excitatory neuron, an inhibitory neuron, a glial cell? Cell state then is something that is more subtle, is um, dynamic, and is superimposed on top of a cell's identity. This is um, a cap, uh, an assessment of a cell's dynamic state of activity or the set of biological processes that it's engaged in at any given time. An example of cell state that's um, relevant to, to neuroscience, relevant to the brain, um, are microglia. So uh, a microglial cell is a microglia from the, uh, throughout its lifespan, but throughout its lifespan, it might exist in many distinct um, functional uh, states. Is it a ramified, a reactive, an amoeboid, a quiescent um, microglia? And to look into cell states, we went back and did something that is um, complementary to the cell type annotation that I described at the beginning. So whereas that cell type annotation it, um, performed clustering of cells based on similarity of their transcriptional signature, this time around, we went back and we uh, looked into how many distinct transcriptional patterns or transcriptional signatures do we observe across all cells in the whole data set. <clears throat> and then this analysis, a cell can be marked by more than one um, transcriptional signature. 
So these transcriptional signatures I'm going to call archetypes. And most of these archetypes show a clean mapping, a one-to-one -one mapping onto a cluster identified cell type. So these archetypes represent cell states, or sorry, excuse me, cell types. In the data, we see a, a smaller number. We see four of these archetypes that don't have this clean one-to-one -one mapping and instead are marking cells that um, they're marking cells across a number of cell types. So the first of these cell state archetypes is something that's been uh, described in other studies of uh, human brain tissue. Um, and this is a cell state that is marked by high expression of the neurogranin gene. The other three cell states we believe to be novel, um, unique to this particular analysis. And um, these three cell states, uh, two of them mark uh, cells across multiple excitatory neuronal populations. Um, though that is the SCTR and the XCS1, excitatory cell state one. Whereas the, the final cell state is marking uh, cells across multiple inhibitory neuronal populations in CS1, inhibitory cell state one. We're especially interested in the excitatory SCTR schizophrenia transcriptional reversal cell state, um, as it has a lot of very intriguing relations to schizophrenia genetics. So first of all, the genes that mark this cell state by their high expression, these are genes that are observed to be downregulated in schizophrenia in other cell types. And that's what's shown in the central heat map here, where the genes named down the left-hand side of the plot are um, markers of this SCTR cell state. They're also downregulated significantly in schizophrenia in the cell uh, types marked by the, the blue squares. These genes are all genome, uh, excuse me, G, uh, significant GWAS genes. And furthermore, the genes in red are further implicated by the schema study. They harbor very rare protein coding mutations that are associated with schizophrenia. These genes, as far as their biological processes, also look very relevant to schizophrenia and implicate postsynaptic processes. The other two cell states, excitatory and inhibitory cell state one, um, they uh, again enrich biological processes that look very relevant to schizophrenia, implicating um, presynaptic processes as well as neurodevelopmental and bioenergetic pathways. And I want to come back to this same TPS plot that I showed you earlier on. This is the same plot, except that now there are three additional rows towards the bottom. These thro three rows, um, uh, which are uh, largely in black, they represent the degree of enrichment of each individual for these three cell states in the data. And the bottom two of these cell states, excitatory and inhibitory cell state one, as you can see in the dot plot to the bottom right, they tend to travel together, meaning that they mark the same individuals. And they are um, positively correlated with schizophrenia transcriptional pathology. They are more enriched in people who have a more schizophrenia-like transcriptional signature. The SCTR, the schizophrenia transcriptional reversal cell state, on the other hand, shows an inverse relationship with transcriptional pathology and schizophrenia. That's what's shown at the bottom left. Um, and this significant inverse correlation is something that we see when this cell state is discovered in the combined data and in each cohort independently. So to say this another way, if we could look back once more at those schizophrenic uh, subjects who are behaving aberrantly, they're showing a more control-like schizophrenia signature, or excuse me, transcriptional signature, those individuals are the ones that are most prominently displaying this SCTR cell state. And while we're still trying to think through how to best interpret this, how to follow up this finding, this is something that I find very, very interesting, especially in the context, again, of, the, of schizophrenia um, heterogeneity, that this cell state appears to be associated with, appears to be marking a subset of schizophrenia individuals whose pathology looks to be distinct from um, the bulk of the subjects uh, in our assessment of this cohort at any rate. So to summarize um, all of this data that I've thrown at you, um, schizophrenia differentially expressed genes predominantly impact excitatory neural populations. These genes implicate neurodevelopmental and synaptic signaling pathways across multiple neuronal populations. Um, we do see a very strong concordance between the genes that are most, that are 
kind of pointed to as potentially uh, relevant to schizophrenia genomic risk loci with um, the more robust genetic data and the fine mapping analyses performed by the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. And looking at these cell states, the SZTR cell state is marked by high expression of genes that are schizophrenia differentially expressed genes and GWAS genes. And this cell state appears to implicate um, postsynaptic processes, whereas the other two cellular states we observed are marked by genes um, involved in bioenergetic and presynaptic pathways and are positively correlated with schizophrenia transcriptional pathology. And finally, the schizophrenia transcriptional reversal cell state is anti-correlated with that transcriptional um, pathology in schizophrenia and marks a subset of individuals that appear to have a distinct pathology that are behaving dis uh, aberrantly compared to the rest of the cohort. So with that said, I'd like to thank um, my team here at McLean, especially um, Subu in my lab, um, the group of Panos Rusos at Mount Sinai, the group of um, Manolis Kellis at MIT who performed the bulk of the computational analysis, our funding um, sources, and of course, um, the Brain Bank, both here at McLean and at uh, Mount Sinai and the family of the donors that gave the tissue that um, made this entire work possible. Thank you, and um, with that, I'll turn it off to you, Dost. Thank you, Brad. I'm going to get my slide started. It's really uh, for those of you who don't spend a lot of time thinking about the biology of schizophrenia, uh, I just want to emphasize how exciting it is to see this kind of uh, really amazing work, uh, you know, looking at the molecular level in individual subjects' brains in specific cell types and specific biochemical mechanisms. It's really something that um, wasn't possible just a few years ago. Um, the story is complex. As you heard, there is no one explanation, one thing that we can say about uh, what the brain looks like in schizophrenia at the molecular level, but it allows us to pursue several mechanisms. So I'm going to um, uh, do a few things uh, in re really in response to what Brad presented. I had a chance, of course, to uh, look at what he was presenting. And so I tailored my comments to sort of respond to the data that Brad showed uh, from the point of view of a clinical researcher and in the clinical world. So starting with my own funding and disclosure slide, and I have no relationships with commercial entities. Uh, so I'll start with uh, the glutamate and GABA story that Brad emphasized. Uh, and as you heard, of course, there is a, a big literature implicating these two critical uh, neurochemicals, neurotransmitters, but also the cells that actually use them uh, in the pathogenesis of schizophrenia. And the glutamate GABA balance and also the activity of each type of cell is really critical for information processing. Um, why are we so excited about glutamate and GABA? It's because of this crisis in dr drug development. So many of you in the clinical world know that uh, we have not had a new antipsychotic introduced uh, with really a meaningfully novel mechanism of action. It's been many decades now. Uh, there is a lot of Me Too drugs. There is a lot of incremental advances, but nothing that really opens a, a, a brand new approach. Uh, existing treatments are only partially effective. They cause significant side effect burden. Uh, so there's huge interest, of course, in the development of new treatments for psychotic disorders. Um, GABA has been tried. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples of uh, late stage failures, um, but you know it's not all a pessimistic uh, message. So uh, a, a, a compound named MK0777 is actually a subtype selective, subunit selective GABA A receptor agonist and uh, because of the, the idea that there must there is an abnormality in GABA signaling in schizophrenia, if you enhance that signaling, uh, you might actually normalize some of those abnormalities. Early studies from David Lewis and colleagues in Pittsburgh have shown both somewhat improved cognition uh, and also specific EEG signatures that actually became normalized in people with schizophrenia. Unfortunately for all of us, really, a subsequent multi-site, adequately powered, randomized controlled study actually was not able to replicate this. Uh, th these studies go back 10 plus years. Uh, so at this point, uh, these GABA uh, A uh, subunit uh, selective agonists are not really considered particularly promising targets. Glutamate, where are we with glutamate? Uh, there have been also uh, molecules such as pomaglutamate, which was uh, developed by Lilly and Bitopertin. Uh, 
uh, which actually I don't remember what company it was developing beta burden, but uh, uh, pomoglumatad was an mglur 2 3 agonist. That's a metabotropic glutamate receptor agonist, and beta burden was a glycine antagonist. There are theoretical reasons for why each of these would be expected to enhance glutamate signaling, especially th through the NMDA receptor. And in each case, there was early positive data that I'm showing on the left hand side here, followed by subsequent negative data. Uh, I'm showing on the right-hand side here, that uh, essentially led to these compounds uh, being halted for development. So I don't think any of these compounds uh, are going to be approved and be used as antipsychotics anytime soon. Um, another exciting lead was sodium nitroprusside. So SNP is actually commonly used in ICUs to lower people's blood pressures. It's a very potent uh, antihypertensive, but it also turns out uh, in lower doses to be a nitric oxide donor in the body. So it leads to the synthesis of nitric oxide, which again stimulates the NMDA receptor, which is part of the theory for uh, improving glutamate signaling in the brain in schizophrenia. Unfortunately, there was an early positive study, but a subsequently well done study out of our colleagues at Mass General uh, showed no response between uh, people taking SMP and people taking placebo. This was actually intravenous infusions. Uh, so once again, uh, early excitement followed by disappointment. In the last decade, we've seen this story over and over. Uh, what's going on? Why, why are we not getting these quick wins with glutamate and GABA? Well, there's a few things to consider. Existing treatments focus on end-stage abnormalities and work for many, though not all, patients. Many of them, as you know, were serendipitously discovered. Uh, what we cared about was, do these compounds change mental states? And if they do, it's off to the races. And we've had a rocky transition from that kind of thinking starting in the 1950s and 60s, to coming into the modern era of treatment development based on pathophysiology. The notion that you can identify a biological abnormality, then develop a small molecule that's gonna become a treatment to normalize that abnormality, that's a very high bar to cross and we have not yet really been successful with it. Future clinical trials really need patient selection uh, guided by biomarkers. So maybe we should be thinking about subgroups of people where the biological abnormality is documented and give those people the treatment that you think will normalize that abnormality, and you might see a stronger signal. Whereas if you take all comers with schizophrenia or all comers with psychotic disorders, you may not get that strong signal because there is heterogeneity. And also, what are the proper endpoints? Uh, first, maybe we should also be looking for outcomes to measure that we know that drug will be impacting instead of looking at some generic uh, clinical outcome like how severity of psychotic symptoms or functioning in the community, first, we should be able to show that this drug is changing the brain in the predicted way, and maybe eventually we're going to um, uh, uh, be able to show the clinical success after that. So like I said, I set the stage in a pessimistic way, but that was really to just uh, 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 open the door for optimism. So I showed you some of the uh, late stage failures, but there are multiple uh, glutamatergic treatments still in development. So many small molecule compounds being developed that uh, modify uh, uh, glutamate signaling in the brain and they may become antipsychotics. So in fact, when patients and families ask me, where is the hope? What's gonna happen? You know, are we around the corner from a major discovery? Uh, my answer to them is, you know, uh, we're not around the corner. There isn't something that's about to be approved by the FDA that's really uh, gonna transform the care of people with schizophrenia but uh, we probably will have meaningfully different treatments coming on the market in the coming decade or so, maybe longer, uh, and they will probably first be glutamatergic. So the glutamate story has actually, there's so much good neuroscience behind it, and you heard from Brad about some of the work that he's doing around this, uh, that uh, it's likely that we will have a success here. And uh, just to really uh, uh, expand on this for a minute, why are we excited about this? Why is this important? It's got implications for heterogeneity of treatment response. Maybe we can select people who will respond to that glutamatergic drug. Some patients will get better on it, others will not. And if we know who's who, we can actually focus the treatment on certain people. They'll uh, almost certainly have completely different side effect profile. They won't uh, you know, cause weight gain and sedation like our existing antipsychotic medications do, but they might have other side effects, maybe seizures, maybe uh, you know, other kinds of neurological problems. So it, that remains to be seen. But if you have two different treatments with very different side effect profiles, maybe we can actually combine both treatments at lower doses and avoid the side effects, but actually provide great relief. So having a totally different mechanism of action would be a, re a real game changer in the care of people with schizophrenia. 
Okay, so that's the glutamate GABA story. I want to highlight two other things really based on what uh, uh, Brad laid out for us. One has to do with bioenergetics. He mentioned bioenergetics, didn't focus on it very much, but I was really intrigued because some of the work that we've done is consistent uh, or, or, or with what uh, Brad was talking about. So we have evidence in our patients, not postmortem, not, not in the brain molecularly, but living, breathing patients uh, where we can do MRI scans and we can quantify energy synthesis. So this is work that was led by uh, my colleague, Fei Du, who's uh, here at McLean, of course, for, for over a decade now. And working together, we were able to show that people with schizophrenia actually synthesize less ATP. I'm not gonna go into the technical details of this. Suffice it to say that uh, you're seeing this uh, exponential decay curve and the lower the curve goes, the more ATP is being synthesized. And on average, people who are healthy, no schizophrenia, uh, synthesize more ATP than people who have schizophrenia. This is at rest. They're not doing anything, just lying in the scanner. Um, so less ATP being synthesized makes us wonder about oxidative phosphorylation, which is a very efficient way of making ATP. One molecule of glucose can give you up to 36 molecules of ATP compared to glycolysis, which only gives you two molecules of ATP. So less efficient ATP might be associated with a shift towards glycolysis. Well, we can uh, actually look at this a, a different way. If there's more glycolysis in the brain, there should be more lactic acid buildup or lactate buildup. And we should see a lower pH or more acidic pH. So uh, Fei Du was uh, able to do exactly that experiment looking at pH uh, in the brain. And sure enough, we see a more acidic and lower pH in the brain in people with schizophrenia compared to healthy controls. So this was really independent evidence for us that there is a shift from oxidative phosphorylation the, the high efficiency way of making ATP to glycolysis, the low efficiency way. What was interesting to me in Brad's slides uh, was that he actually sees an upregulation of the machinery for doing oxidative phosphorylation. So we're seeing a shift away from it, but there's an upregulation. Uh, so this is a very interesting situation. It's not a simple story of deficiency. Something is wrong and there is just low levels. Uh, but what it might suggest is that people with schizophrenia, there is some kind of roadblock and they are trying to upregulate oxidative phosphorylation and generate more ATP. So the gene transcription is up, but they're not able to do it, uh, in fact. So uh, when we do the brain scans in living, breathing patients, we actually see evidence for a shift away from oxidative phosphorylation. So I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, riddle that we should try to solve. I'm not gonna go into the details of this. Uh, suffice it to say that glycolysis is very interesting. If you think about it for a second, I, I, I put up uh, oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis. Glycolysis usually happens when there is no oxygen. So it's called anaerobic glycolysis. But actually, our patients with schizophrenia, they have oxygen in their brains. So that's not what's going on here. What's going on here is aerobic glycolysis. And aerobic glycolysis happens when cells are changing shape. In fact, this happens in cancer. It's called the Warburg effect. If, you, if any of you studied cancer, um, you know, aerobic glycolysis is something that cancer cells do very well. It also happens in a developing embryo. And that's what I'm showing you here. This green region of the embryo is rapidly growing. Cells are dividing and the embryo is changing shape. And there's a lot of glycolysis that happens there. Once the basic layout of the, of the body has, has stabilized on the left-hand side of this embryo where it's white, uh, glycolysis turns off and you actually get oxidative phosphorylation. So it's fascinating that in people with schizophrenia, maybe there's something that, that's about remodeling of neurons that's actually consistent with this shift towards glycolysis. And the reason, of course, we, uh, we're all interested in bioenergetics is because bioenergetics actually can be targeted with lots of small molecules. This is an old slide, but it's a nice list. It shows you literally dozens of medications that may improve mitochondrial function and uh, energy metabolism in the brain. So there might be something on this list that we could repurpose and use for patients with schizophrenia and other things as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's promising for that reason. And finally, I wanna uh, tie to another thing that Brad talked about that we are working on on the clinical side and that's brain development, neurodevelopment. So of course, Brad, Brad laid out uh, a series of genes that are actually differentially expressed in schizophrenia that are important for the developing brain. Um, and this slide, uh, another well-known slide that's 10 years plus old now, uh, uh, shows you that there are deviations. It's a very busy slide. I'm not gonna uh, get into the details, but what it's showing you is that even starting from birth, from age zero, or even before in utero, and then especially in childhood and into early adolescence, there's deviations in normal developmental mechanisms in schizophrenia. So what this says is that when somebody ha ha gets a diagnosis of schizophrenia at age 20 or 25, that's not the beginning of the illness. 
that's a culmination of processes that started with brain development. So we really need to be curious about brain development and see what we can do to change that. This is actually a hopeful message. This is another very uh, ancient but well-known slide uh, that shows uh, this uh, uh, deterioration in functioning and also in worsening clinical symptoms in early phases of illness and schizophrenia. And the question is really this red line. If schizophrenia is developmental, things are happening before diagnosis, can we intervene early to bend this curve, to prevent the deterioration? Maybe even, of course, this is a, a pipe dream, but maybe even uh, prevent the onset of the illness. Uh, think about how that would change the face of, of uh, 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 clinical care in schizophrenia and even really uh, psychiatry more broadly. We're nowhere close to this. This is a long-term effort. But this notion of developmental abnormalities, as Brad is uncovering them, uh, really uh, gives us motivation to intervene early. So we've been doing that at McLean and all around the country and the world. There is a movement for early intervention. Uh, the standard of care is uh, what people call coordinated specialty care or CSC. This is team-based and multidisciplinary. So when you have an 18, 20, 25 year old becoming diagnosed with schizophrenia, the standard of care now is not for them to get care in a, a, an office somewhere in the community and see a doctor once a week or once a month and, and be done with it. They need a care, a, a, a team care, a team to come in and uh, uh, start helping that person. And there's a lot on the slide that's about the various aspects of how we take care of, of these patients uh, in a very specialized way early on. Uh, the National Institute of Mental Health and IMH is actually starting something called EPINET or Early Psychosis Intervention Network. That's bringing uh, uh, lots of clinics, over 100 clinics from around the country to come together and compare notes and share their data uh, to try and discover the best ways of intervening early. And we at McLean are part of that. Uh, uh, our LEAP Center uh, at McLean is actually the hub for Massachusetts. There's a collection of six clinics, including ours in Massachusetts, where we're part of EpiNet. And as you can see, EpiNet is all around the country. And we're, we're collaborating with NIMH to, to again, you know, work on the same platform, compare notes, and share our data. So we're excited about this early intervention effort and uh, really proud that uh, McLean in Massachusetts can be represented in this national early intervention platform. Uh, uh, our LEAP Center is collaborating also within our state of Massachusetts with MACNET, which is uh, funded by the Department of Mental Health. They've been developing a statewide strategic plan for early psychosis. And so together we've held uh, a couple of conferences, bringing together patients, families, community partners, clinicians, researchers, insurance payers, state policymakers to debate what is what are the strategic priorities and what should Massachusetts be doing to intervene early in, in, uh, in people with psychotic disorders? And uh, uh, earlier this year, the first product from this strategic roadmap was published uh, in, in the journal Schizophrenia Research. So there is now a document and the state DMH is starting to adopt elements of this document. More to come, so stay tuned. Uh, but I thought it was really nice to see that the neurodevelopmental discoveries that Brad is making uh, line up so so nicely with a lot of the early intervention efforts that are out there that we're also involved in. Okay, I'll stop there and I'll thank you for your attention. And I think there are a few questions, of course, we're happy to answer questions. Thank you to both of you. Uh, we, do, we do have some questions coming in. I wanna, um, if people, have additional questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of them as we can. The first question is, how might all of this relate to epigenetic events, such as the association between maternal influenza infection during pregnancy and fetal develop, uh, uh, you know, the, the fetus subsequently developing schizophrenia? So I'll, oh, go ahead. I'll speak to that to say that, um, so yeah, as Chris mentioned when he was introducing me, that epigenetics is my um, main interest. And uh, so this is the first uh, transcriptomic gene expression study that I've been focused on. Um, and so I am interested in epigenetics in that its ability to be cell type specific. So that's the, the key to that elaboration of a common genome to cell type specific phenotype. Um, and while I, I can't speak to how um, in, uh, sorry specific environmental exposures may or may not be impacting the changes that we see here that uh, this data is showing. Um, it is epigenetics that I expect are predominant or are large players in 
this as the phenotypic outcome of these cells. Uh, that's the insult that is making this change um, occur on top of the uh, genetic background of, uh, of, that we see in schizophrenic, schizophrenic individuals. Moving forward, so I'm very excited about these technologies that let you dissect the brain into its component parts um, with high throughput in ways that weren't possible before. And kind of the work that I'm we're getting into now is using similar genetics, uh, genetic technologies that let you read out both gene expression and um, the epigenetic state uh, using an, a, a, something called ATTACK, the assay for transposable, transposase accessible chromatin. And so epigenetics is a very, very complex system um, hundreds of distinct histone modifications, DNA modifications, RNA modifications. Attack kind of gives you a bird's eye view of the overall transcriptional landscape. And um, there is uh, one of the stories that comes out of the data that I presented today that I didn't get into is some interesting th uh, stuff that looks into the linkage of those transcription factors that we see um, linked to the differential gene expression and when and where they're expressed uh, during neurodevelopment. And it gets a bit speculative. It maybe gets a little far from what the data can robustly say, but it does look to implicate um, overexpressed genes appear to be from an early developmental time frame in schizophrenia. So we interpret this as kind of a failure of progression of the typical epigenomic landscape where genes that are upregulated in the adults where we're making these measurements are a failure to turn off more early or fetal-like transcriptional programs. And then that downregulation is the result of a, a failure to progress, a failure to induce more adult typical um, epigenomic programs. A bit rambling, but I hope that addressed the question somewhat. Great, no, thank you. The, um, the next question is going to go to Dr. Unger. Uh, is the entire brain acidic in schizophrenia or just specific areas? Yeah, I, I didn't have time to, you know, do anything just uh, other than scratch the surface. But uh, the short answer is we've collected data in the prefrontal cortex. So we know that it's happening in the prefrontal cortex. We have not uh, done any experiments elsewhere in the brain. The data quality that you need to collect this kind of uh, information uh, it, it's got to be very high, so we can do this in specific parts of the brain. We can't, you know, uh, choose any part of the brain that we want. We're limited in where this kind of data can be collected. So right now, we really only know that it's in the prefrontal cortex. And, well, and it raises a larger question, which is, you know, for, for some disorders such as OCD, we have clear neural networks that are implicated in the pathophysiology. What are, do we have clear neural networks for schizophrenia? Well, I think the short answer is there are certain brain regions that are more typically associated with schizophrenia, sure, like anterior cingulate, ventral striatum, uh, hippocampus, uh, and medial temporal lobe. So yes, there is a bit of a, a circuit. But you know, um, uh, coming from a biochemical point of view, uh, I think it would be astonishing if there was some specific brain circuit that's completely abnormal and the rest of the brain is completely normal. So it's much more likely to be gradients across these brain regions and adjacent regions uh, because you know, the brain is just not organized in that completely segregated way. So I, uh, I, I would say that there's, there, the rest of the brain will be affected, Great. maybe to a lesser extent. So this next question is specifically for DOSE as well. Some companies are developing NMDA receptor drugs for cognitive deficits. Why do you think glutamatergic drugs would treat positive symptoms versus neurocognitive deficits? Yeah, it's a good question. And I didn't mean to, uh, um, you know, imply that uh, it, it, they would only be used for positive symptoms. I just didn't have time to go into it. But absolutely, some companies are already looking at cognitive deficits. And in fact, those are some of the more important outcomes potentially, because cognitive deficits are associated with functional outcomes. So being able to hold a job, live independently, have meaningful relationships. Uh, they're not necessarily impaired by positive symptoms as much as they're impaired by cognitive deficits. So they're definitely a target. It was just okay. that I, I, I didn't go into it. Okay. The next question, if glutamate is thought to be a neurotransmitter that's dysregulated in schizophrenia, um, is there any evidence that prescribing anticonvulsants can be a rational treatment strategy? I take this too, Brad. I mean, so uh, anticonvulsants in general are not great antipsychotics. Uh, th there are subsets of patients uh, that can benefit from being on an anticonvulsants in addition to antipsychotics but they're, they're just not the same. We don't really know the, the reason why. 
Um, but you know, anticonvulsants also don't all uniformly act on the glutamate system. There's a lot of heterogeneity within that group of, of medications. So it's it's likely that they're just not uh, you know doing what we need them to do in the brain. Great. And um, maybe one last question, if you have time. Uh, it, you you both stressed a lot the heterogeneity, and for those of you who don't know, that it, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the genes that have been found to predispose to certain illnesses. So one person asks, are there implications for other neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism spectrum disorder um, that overlap with schizophrenia at the molecular level? Brad, do you want to start this? So in, in the data today, um, so yes, there is a lot of interest and a lot of genetic studies have found a lot of shared um, contribution of common genes to multiple disorders. Um, from my knowledge of the literature, I think autism is one that is more distinct from schizophrenia. And that's something that we see in this data where um, when we do more systematic efforts to link the differentially expressed genes we observe here in schizophrenia to GWAS risk loci from multiple distinct uh, disorders, um, we see kind of a gradient where we see the strongest uh, linkage between schizophrenia and GWAS um, kind of middling with bipolar disorder, less with uh, depression, and then uh, kind of trailing at the end, we see the least um, association, the least concordance between our genes and autism implicated genetic risk loci. Great. So with that, we're going to have to end. We're a little bit past time. So I want to thank both of you for uh, great presentations and a really good discussion. And uh, thank you all for attending. Um, and we will see you next week. Or actually not next week because it's a holiday. So we'll see you in three weeks. <laughs> so happy holidays. <laughs>